Hi, I'm Stunning Stella Cheeks. And I'm the Enigma Aaron Klein. And this is Not Not Your Your Demographic. Demographic. We used to be a feminist wrestling podcast. Shockingly, we'd rather talk about literally anything else now. Eternity leave. <laughs> T minus less than 10 days. Eight days. Whoa. I know. <laughs> Woo. Feel like you just got punched in the chest. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to steal your thunder or anything, but like I'm having the appropriate uh, symptoms for a, a, a spouse. I'm your work wife and I am having, <laughs> I'm having like spousal syndrome or whatever it is where you're like, have the empathy and like whatever. And you're also nervous. <laughs> I'm having, I'm having that as your work wife. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. I get it. I get it. It's, again, this is one of the first babies that like really directly impacts your life. Well, it directly impacts my life, but you're also one of my oldest and closest yeah. friends. So it's like, I literally talk to you every day. Yeah. <laughs> like, so it is also just like, it's an intimate experience. Like I will de facto, I mean, you have siblings, like this kid yeah. will have a lot of aunts, but I will also be the weird yeah. aunt that's yeah. around. Oh, totally. 100%. <laughs> I also like, live in the same city as you and pizzazz and your sisters don't so like i'm going to be around this baby a fucking lot and i am excited but also like oh my god it's almost here i know (laughs) so close i'm so close so So, happy (laughs) i guess i could say how are you but i guess that's how you are yeah that's how i am i'm (laughs) enormously fucking pregnant if you'd like to see oh yeah i was just gonna say if you want to see how pregnant hop on over to aaron's instagram because it is farcical yes (laughs) i haven't taken a ton of photos of myself during the pregnancy because i like haven't gone anywhere or had any reason to like dress up at all basically (laughs) and so i was like i should take a photo because i'm like done this is like as pregnant as i'm gonna get and so i took a photo and was like oh my god (laughs) I have like a straight up yoga ball sitting on my midsection. (laughs) It's so big. (laughs) Yeah, it's very big. It's funny. My youngest sister in our family group chat was like, man, I I feel like Megan wasn't quite as big as you were. So I looked up her photos and she sent me hers at, I'm at, uh, I'll be 29 weeks when this podcast comes out. So I was at 38 and a couple days when I took that photo. And so Caitlin sent us a photo of uh, Megan at 40 so two more weeks than I was. And she's considerably smaller than I am. I was like, about to have a fuck? big boy. That's right. And her kids were like nine pounds each. I was like, what the fuck? How big is this baby? My doctor was like, I'm thinking like seven and a half pounds. Megan was like, yeah, that's what they told me. And then they were nine pounds. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. I have an 11 pound baby. <laughs> go big or go home. That's what it fucking feels like, dude. How are you? <laughs> Other than your work wife, uh, tangential anxiety (laughs) i'm doing pretty good shockingly hell yeah pretty normal pretty good fuck yeah dude a lot of my work stuff has kind of slowly started to fall back into place and i think the new meds that i'm on are like really healthy hell yeah it's not perfect but it's it's nice hell yeah man it's pretty good mellow medication works (laughs) yeah medication Thumbs up from Cell Cheeks. Big <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> hey, if your brain can't make it naturally, nothing wrong with store bought. That is the way to go. No big deal. I have a store bought brain. So, you know, very fancy. <laughs> very, very. So, are you trying to like fit in a million books before you <laughs> poop out I mean, a baby? Kind of. I'm like. I've already finished like 24 books this year, which is fucking insane because as we record this, it's February 6th. <laughs> like it is nuts to have read so many books this year. It feels like, uh, but I don't, I don't do anything. I don't go anywhere. I'm like, I'm so pregnant that I could go into labor at any fucking moment, basically. But also like, I don't, I mean, I didn't want to get COVID before, but like, I really can't get COVID now. Like right. I'm, I'm in the, the space where like I have to not get COVID right now. (laughs) This would be like the most inconvenient time possible to get COVID. So I'm, I'm just at home all the time. All I do is go to the library and the doctor's office and like do fuck 
nothing else so i'm cramming in books i'm also taking a lot of baths so i'm listening to a shitload of audiobooks nice very excited to renew my membership literally the (laughs) day before i go give birth so that's exciting (laughs) but yes i've read a ton first and foremost i finished an audiobook called descent by alexandra wood i thought at first i didn't like it because it's an immersive audio experience and so they recommend that you listen to it with headphones on and it gave me such fucking bad anxiety i legit almost had a panic attack it was it was too good the immersive experience was too good it freaked me the fuck out and so i thought at first i didn't like it and then i couldn't stop thinking about it for like an entire day afterwards and i've decided it is actually very good and i would recommend it but if you are an anxiety person maybe don't take their advice and listen to it with headphones maybe if you have say a panic disorder and you're nine months pregnant maybe it's not a great idea perhaps don't listen to it with headphones but it's about a uh, a pair of sisters who their mother has just died and one of them comes home for christmas and they're the second sister is picking her up from the train station and her car breaks down. And so they have to walk back to her house. And so it's this conversation that they're having over this like three, four mile walk that they have to do. And they're both like in their fifties. And over the course of this talk, you find out that their mother, when she died, they, everyone said that she had Alzheimer's, but what the sister who is picking up the other sister who's come home is telling her is, I don't think she actually had Alzheimer's. I think she was haunted by a ghost. And I think she was talking to this ghost up until she died. And she started speaking in her uh, native language, which I think was Ukraine, but I don't remember off the top of my head. And so she had the, the daughter records what she's saying and has it translated post-mortem after her mother's died. And so she starts to realize like, Oh, you were actually haunted by a ghost. And she finds out that her, the mother who died, her dad was a Nazi war criminal and had emigrated to England under false pretenses. And that this ghost that is haunting their mother was one of his victims in the camp. And so the mother inherits this ghost from the Nazi war crime father. And then when she dies, the daughter who was taking care of her also inherits the ghost. And so this ghost like, multi-generationally haunts this family for being murdered in a nazi war camp and it is frightening (laughs) it was very frightening it was it was such an interesting concept about the idea of like intergenerational guilt and also like the second daughter who comes home and is like we didn't know about this like why is this our responsibility to bear and the idea is like well you this was never addressed like he got away with it and right and like really benefited from the fact that he had become a a war criminal and like someone has to pay for this and the daughter the daughter who's being haunted is like maybe we should set up some kind of memorial for him maybe we should like figure out if he has any family left and like light spoiler though this isn't like the big twist at the end the ghost doesn't care the ghost is just like, no, the only thing that matters is that your family's fucking haunted and is going to stay fucking haunted. And it was wild. <laughs> it was a wild ride. It's only like an hour and a half long, but it was, I like I said, I thought I didn't like it at first because the immersive quality of the audiobook was so good, but the story itself was just so fucking interesting. And like, ultimately what happens to the daughter who's being haunted is pretty fucked up <laughs> and like i thought they did a i don't want to spoil it because i think you actually should like listen to it and 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 get experience. to this twist yeah but it was it was fucked up <laughs> but it was good because we hear and read a lot about generational trauma but like what about like generational guilt yeah and how mm-hmm. that manifests in a horror way i think sounds really fascinating yeah i think you will really like this it's it was I love really spooky good. shit <laughs> yeah you love spooky shit now and it's included with audible plus too so it's you can get it for free and it's worth it for free for sure <laughs> our our podcast not sponsored by audible but you would Fuck never it know that should be. <laughs> yeah, it really should be at this point uh I read a shitload of poetry also the last couple of weeks. I don't know why. I think I must have like in a fever dream read through somebody's list of best poetry of the last year. And so I just requested a bunch of shit that all came in at the same time. And I was like, guess I'm going to read four poetry books this week. 
<laughs> normal for you. Yeah, that does seem pretty on brand. Uh, I read our friend Warwick recommended because he read it for one of his classes, Head Off and Split by Nikki Finney, which was really fucking good. I think you would really like it because the first it's split into three sections and the first section is like political in a way that I've never read poetry that's so directly political. It's like some of them are, are poems from like George W. Bush's standpoint at his last um, inaugural address or not his, his last state of the union. And it was so good. She, the author is black and queer and the way that she describes his thought process was both hilarious and also like awful. <laughs> and so I really enjoyed that. And then there were a couple, there was like a series of poems that were from the perspective of Condoleezza Rice, which was bizarre and like enjoyable in a way that I was not expecting. The middle section is more about her being a queer woman. And then at the end, it like all comes together and she like ties the two sections together. It was very good. It was weird, but like, it was weird because it's so much time has passed since W's presidency that like while I was reading it, I was like, is this Obama? What is, oh, oh, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> it's, yeah. So I, I enjoyed it. I would definitely recommend it. I also read um, The Reinhardt Frames by Cheswea Mafanza. This was, I just tried to describe this to Michael and he was like, that sounds awful. It's experimental poetry. <laughs> so the idea is that there are these, frames that it's based on like a it's an old movie called like frame 42 and the invisible man and it's like a the two are having a conversation with each other and so there are these frames which they are called centros that are framed around original poems but the centros are all collaged works where every single line is taken from another piece of like literature or movies or other poetry if i had not read the foreword for this i would never have known that it was put together in such a brilliant way that like it all sounds like original text and so after reading the foreword i wasn't sure if it was just the centros or all of the poems were like that and so then when you get to the end there's like 20 pages of notes that cite all of the individual lines that are taken from other Ooh, things interesting i love that it, it was really really good i really enjoyed it and it was i love an end note or i hate an end note i do love a footnote though and i love reading um bibliography <laughs> so that yeah. sounds like particularly fun for me yeah i think you would really enjoy this it was just it was such a like i don't love experimental poetry it's not like really my jam but it was just such a well put together piece of art and like it is as a whole collection was just so well done i really enjoyed it i also read um philomath by devin waka figueroa this was a, a woman writing poems about a ghost town in oregon that she grew up in which was also like very bizarre but <laughs> it she was she's such a gifted poet that there were times where I like forgot that I was reading poetry. It, it just all flowed together so well that I thought she did a fucking fantastic job. I really, really enjoyed it. Philomath is the name of the town that she's from. That's why it's called that. I read Cutlish by Rajiv Mohar Mohabir. I really wanted to like this. It was uh, a Indian poet who is also queer and the content of his poems was really interesting and the perspective of a like of a queer Guyanese person I really enjoyed but the structure was so basic it was distracting it's all like two line stanzas and then there'll be like one poem that's like short like t like Misha the way that Misha Collins writes poetry where it's those like short line stanzas it was all two line stanzas one poem that was like Misha Collins style and then it'd go back to the two line stanzas and they were all like that and I got to the end and was like that was so distracting <laughs> it was so distracting that there was like no variety in the structure like whatsoever basically so I enjoyed the content but it just it didn't work for me in a way I really wanted it to work in a way that it just like did not for me but the well, content that's a big is thing with poetry right like part of right. the reason you read poetry is for the form right it's not just the content it's like reading a comic book like the story could be really good but if the art is really distracting or bad it's gonna take you out of it 
Like exactly. I've been struggling to read Black and Key by one of my favorite authors. Like I love Joe Hill. I've read literally everything else he's ever written, but I'm struggling through Lock and Key because I hate the art. Like yeah. it's hard. And if you're reading poetry, even if the content is interesting or well written, the form is part of it. Right, exactly. And I just found it so distracting that it was so simplistic. So uh, it's like a tentative recommendation for me. <laughs> and then I also read, uh, this is a coffee table book, but I really, I, I enjoyed it in lots of ways. It's called Bold Words from Black Women by Tamara Pizzoli. It's it's a coffee table book that is, it's basically like a quote compilation, but the illustrations are fucking beautiful they're so good i follow the artist whose name i don't have written down so i apologize about that i follow her on instagram and she was posting about like i illustrated this book that is coming out and i'm i really enjoyed working on it and when i saw the illustrations i was like oh this sounds fucking great so i requested it from the library it's so easy it took me like literally 40 minutes to read the whole thing it, i read the whole thing in the bath it was it's a very quick coffee table read it's just beautiful my biggest complaint about it was that it didn't give in my opinion enough context about the women who were being quoted like josephine baker is one of the women that's quoted and the author leaves out that like she was an international spy and that was like a huge part of who she was and like queen latifah is included and quoted but it's it's left out that like a huge part of her presence in media is that she's a queer woman who's been out for like ever basically so it was weird it was like okay i understand that this is also this is supposed to be like an all ages coffee table book so you can also like give it to your kids but like you can include that stuff it didn't yeah it, it, it felt it, it was Wait, like, so weird did they just talk about josephine baker was a like cabaret performer yeah it, she was like an activist and a cabaret performer and a dancer and it was like well these things are all true but like she used a lot of her performance stuff to be an effective spy yeah she like defected to france because of the racism of the united states and it felt like weird to not include that yeah. that was like my biggest complaint about it but it was so visually stunning that it was like okay the real point of this is the visual aspect of it so in that i i would recommend picking it up from the library just to read through it again it took me like 40 minutes it's it's a very very easy read and then i i've been listening to this series the overall series is called bloodlands they're by harold Schechter. but i read i listened to i think four yeah, four individual series inside of these. The Pied Piper, The Brick Slayer, Panic, and Little Slaughterhouse on the Prairie. They're all narrated by our guy, Steven Weber. Ow, fucking ow. excellent. <laughs> so, of course, they're, they're fucking great. Like, as an audio piece, they're all great because he could read the goddamn phone book and be good at it. Like, they're all about an hour. So, one of them, Little Slaughterhouse, or no, Panic is like an hour and a half. I think there's three more after this, and then I'll be done with the series. But they're all about American true crime that are set at different like eras in America. But what I really like about them is that they're all they're about crimes that I like. I know a lot about true crime. I've listened and I've read a lot of true crime. I don't know any of these stories. And so they're all new to me, which I'm really enjoying. But the thing that binds all of these individual ones together is about the American literature and american fiction that these crimes influenced and so like you get to the the end for most of them except for little slaughterhouse on the prairie which is at the beginning they talk about little house on the prairie and it, they talk about the way that this crime became like infused into the american culture in a way that i've just found absolutely fascinating i think that harold Schechter does a great job of talking about that panic is a little different because that one's about the um the sex crimes panic of the 1930s and so instead of just talking about literature it talks about the way that people blamed swing music for like child sex crimes which is fucking batshit insane like it makes no sense but then world war ii happens like immediately after that and so people just forgot about it and just like moved on and we're like whatever we don't need to think about this anymore lol just kidding this was just a panic that we had so i, I thought it was really interesting the way that he talks about literature specifically in most of them but the way that like culture revolves around american true crime so i highly recommend the bloodland series it's really fucking good and then i read one other book <laughs> called night bitch by rachel yoder which i almost bought you for christmas and i'm really fucking glad i didn't <laughs> i 
hated it. <laughs> I hated it so much. So many people recommended it. I saw it on Somebody a literally recommended it to me that morning and then you posted the picture on Instagram like I hated this book and I'm like, "Well, now I'm conflicted." I really want you to read it cuz I'm really curious how you react to this this narrator. So, I talked last year about the upstairs house and how I fucking hated that. This reminded me of the upstairs house in a lot of ways. It's about a woman who has recently given birth and her reactions to being a mother and what that's like. And in upstairs house, she has postpartum psychosis and sees ghosts in her stairwell and whatever. Again, I didn't care for it. Uh, In Night Bitch, she turns into a dog. And then like... (laughs) Your face. Does... Like, okay... I was like halfway through this book and she's an artist. And so she's talking about like having gone to art school and what it's like to interact with working mothers who continued to work when she decided to be a stay at home mom and the like envy of an artist with other artists who are succeeding in a field that you are, which like feels like it should be something that I connect very deeply with, but I fucking hated her so much that I was like, I don't care. I don't care that you're not living the dream that you want to because really your problem is that your marriage sucks and you never should have had a kid with this person and you don't communicate with your husband on any fucking level and you need therapy. And like, I just couldn't get past that. It was like, I just, I think I just can't deal with books where the main character's problem would be solved by therapy and they just go, I don't wanna. And like, that's not good enough. Like, I just couldn't get past it. And like, very light spoilers on this. I got halfway through it and I was like, literally the only thing that could make this worse if there was some like terrible performance art in it. And then spoiler, the end (laughs) is that she does fucking terrible performance art about it. And I was just like, I'm disgusted. (laughs) Like I, I was like, it has to get better. It has to fucking get better. And I got to like the very last page and was like, it did not get fucking better. (laughs) Like I really hated it. It's so interesting because like I'm struggling with this right now finding books because like I I don't personally like real serial killers, real crime, true crime. I'm going to listen to that series that you recommended because I like the idea behind it. I like the narrator and they're also really short so I can try one decide if I like it and whatever. But I do really like. I'm start. I'm getting. I I I think I need to stop saying I'm getting into horror. I'm into horror now. It's fine. Yes. (laughs) And I specifically like serial killer stuff but i like (laughs) charming serial killers and i like bad people who are charming like when we read um my year of rest and relaxation she's Mm -hmm. awful she's she's terrible super charming or when we read luster like the two women in that awful definitely Mm -hmm. need therapy I really like both of them, though. Or yes. perfect example, right? Uh, um, a certain hunger. That's the, the pinnacle. Yes. Like certain hunger. Mm-hmm. She's a murderer. She eats people. I love her. Yes. <laughs> She's the best. Yes. So I, I want charming sociopaths and charming criminals. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I like an unlikable narrator. It's not like right. I, I totally dislike that concept. But, like, there is a very fine line for me, apparently. (laughs) I think there is just, there is a fine line. And when you're looking for, like, I really like this book, let me see other books that are like it. There is, I feel like it's a, for every one you find with that good, bad narrator, there's three you read that's like, well, these people just suck. (laughs) These people are bad and are bad, bad and not fun, bad. I feel like part of it for me is if it if the narrator is an unlikable woman who's not married, I'm way more into it because I feel like so much of unlikable women narrators when they're married is my relationship is bad and I refuse to address that my relationship is bad. And it's like, okay, well, that's boring. I don't give a fuck about that. Like, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. You married someone you never should have fucking married. Like, I just don't have any sympathy for that. But like rest and relaxation, certain hunger, luster are great examples of single women who are unlikable. And it's like, oh, it's just your personality. So I would say in luster, the, the wife in that is married and shouldn't be in that relationship, but it's so deeply like weird and her relationship with the other woman 
there is something charming about her too. The fact that she just like straight up kills her neighbor's dog. But it's not told from her perspective either. That's true. Which, That's true. Like if that book had been told from her perspective, I probably would have fucking hated it. That's like, fair. Oh, you're in a, a one-sided open relationship because your shitty husband doesn't communicate with you like yeah not for me that's not a book i give a fuck about <laughs> so i think that that's that is part of my line personally yeah hit me up with the the wrecks of charming awful people it's like the, it's like we in the society love an anti-hero yes. it's just it's similar to that like mm-hmm. i have to i don't have to relate to you i don't want to eat somebody but i want to like be cheering for you a little right. bit <laughs> yes absolutely and at no point in night bitch was i ever cheering for her to succeed it was just like i hate this i hate this woman i hate her stupid child i hate her fucking husband i hate her art i hate all of this <laughs> uh, and then finally i finished for our not your demo book club which we just had our meeting for earlier tonight and it was super was, great and fun it was so fun i'm really really glad that we've started like committing to this uh i read point b by drew mcgarry which was my pick for our book club I really liked it. I mean, we talked a lot about it in book clubs, so yeah. I feel like we don't really need to rehash through all of this, but I really I really enjoyed it. I think Postmortal yeah. is better only because it was published through a publishing house and, and had, had the, an editor. <laughs> had yeah, had the benefit of a professional editor working on it where this was self-published for reasons we literally cannot figure <laughs> out. Like Drew McGarry is like a really prominent publisher. Truly author. at this point we just need to like at him on Twitter and be like, just curious, we read this book for book club. Big fan. Why is it self-published? Can you yeah. elucidate that for <laughs> us, please? <laughs> Very curious and have a lot of questions. Uh but it, the idea it's it's called point B, a teleportation love story. And the idea is that it's the year like 2031, I think 2030, 2031. Yeah. Something like that. Um, And the idea is that everyone has smartphones that you can teleport through. You pick up a location anywhere in the world and you step through a wormhole and you're there automatically. And part of the book is the ethics of that. And like the ethics of the future tech that exists and what it does to people and how it fundamentally changes the world but then the other half is that it's told from the first person view of a 17 year old at a private boarding school who is a lesbian and falls in love with her roommate and it's honestly surprisingly well written from the perspective (laughs) of a lesbian considering it's by like a straight white man (laughs) i wrote this line down when i was reading it because it totally sums up the like thesis of it it just says this is a classic case of greed warping what should be a miracle of technology yes absolutely and i really liked it i there there are obviously problems with it because it's a self-published book and like there if it had gone through a professional editor or a professional publishing house i think would have been cleaned up a little bit more but in general like i really liked it yeah it it deals with a lot of ethical stuff with technology and monopolies and politics and and borders and immigration. And that's like the world building part. But again, yeah, it's told through the perspective of this 17 year old who is just trying to find her way in the world and come back from like a really traumatic thing that happened to her because of porting technology. And it's this balance of like, I'm a teenager trying to change the world and like, battle against this evil corporation but also i'm having a lot of feelings <laughs> yeah <laughs> and there's like a pretty solid uh, little found family so <laughs> yeah yeah there's like a nice found family inside of it it's it was quirky characters that are not annoying in their quirkiness like they felt annoying but they also felt like 17 year olds who are trying to figure out who they are and a lot of them go through some pretty intense character development and i think it makes sense if you just remember at the age of everybody, it makes a lot of sense and makes it like a really charming read. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. So that's that's everything that I read. <laughs> it's a shitload of it. What all did you read other than point B, obviously? Which you Yes, I read point B through the night. I was up most of the night reading point B. Ridiculous. <laughs> I read a decent amount in the past two weeks. I liked a lot of it, but if I'm starting with the things that I like the least, so I did listen to that audible book that you recommended a mind of her own by paula Mm mclean that's like a short thing about marie curie falling in love with uh, pierre 
Mm-hmm. I liked the audio acting in it and I liked the idea of it, but it just felt like the first two chapters of a longer book. And that yes. was annoying to me. I was like, I, I totally want more that. of this. It just yeah, I totally get it. Sort of abruptly ends. And I was like, ah, I'm annoyed, but I was shoveling snow. So I was like, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't care. At least I'm listening to something while I'm doing this horrible labor mini rant on, you know, when you own your own property, you have to shovel or else like you're the dick and I don't want to yeah. be the dick on the, on the block. I read this book called Fortune Favors the Dead by Stephen Spotswood. It has a really cool cover. It's a noir book. And I was in a giant cool bookstore and I was just walking around for like an hour and I grabbed a stack of books and that was one of them. I It took me a really long time to read it. It's well written. I like it. But I thought I would like it more because it is a noir story i like noir stories it is a queer story the main character the main detective is pentecost and then her girl friday or whatever is parker who is queer and it's kind of like implied that pentecost is too but like the the young girl is queer and like goes on like dates but it's set in the like 1930s so they have to be you know more secretive about it and the mystery is pretty good. Like I didn't know what was going to happen really until near the end, but there's something about it that just didn't keep me interested and I wasn't compelled to read it. And then near the end, I was like, well, I'm super dumb. This is just Sherlock Holmes, but in like the 1930s with ladies, which I've read Sherlock Holmes with like Ladies, there was that series that I talked about Mm -hmm. um, earlier. I think the first one was called like A Study in Scarlet Women. Yeah, it was called A Study in Scarlet Women. And I really liked that series. So that was really clever. And so once I kind of figured that out, I was like, okay, this is just kind of like a pretty basic whatever. It's not bad, but it's not good. I wouldn't read it anymore. But then we get to the end and the like Moriarty character was really interesting and compelling and was like, a Moriarty character for good, like still chaotic and still like people die and still whatever, but like they had better intentions than like normal Moriarty's do. And that was very interesting to me. (laughs) And they were also implied as being like queer. And I know that this is a series and part of me is like, man, I didn't even really like reading this, but this like last chapter makes me want to read more because I want (laughs) to know more about this one character. And that pisses me off. So I'm very like, because the whole book was meh, but then we get to the end and I was like, oh man, this Moriarty lady, I can't remember her name in the book. She's not Moriarty. And then it's also a twist who she is. But I like that idea of like, what if an evil genius still did evil shit, but it was for the greater good? Mm Mm-hmm. That is interesting. Unlikable women, yeah. Yeah, she is a charming, unlikable woman. Yes. (laughs) Speaking of, so I've been looking for books about uh, specifically female sociopaths. And if you Google female sociopath books, it's a lot of true crime stuff. And like, again, true crime to me is like not interesting. But so I've been looking for fiction stuff. And I, I made a list, but a thing that kept showing up on the list was You by Carolyn Kepnes, which is not a book with a female sociopath as the main character. It follows like Joe or whatever. And I've, I've avoided the show because like, I don't want to watch a show about a dude stalking a woman. That sounds nope. not good. But a lot of people that I think are smart and whose opinions I respect are like, oh, it's so good. I'm like, I don't understand. Whatever. But when I was looking at these lists, it found out that it's written by a woman and that intrigued me. And I was like, what is a book about a man told from a man's perspective about stalking a woman written by a woman like? And I'm so conflicted about it. I just punched my wall. (laughs) I'm so (laughs) conflicted about it. It's super well written. It's really interesting. The satire of it is compelling the the way that joe justifies his actions and you see like the hoops he jumps through is fascinating the way that like it's so easy to be stalked in our society is really fascinating Uh and the whole time just knowing that it was written by a woman really made it a better read for me because if it was written by a dude i would just be like so this dude is just living all his weird fantasy cool but the fact that this woman like 
I feel like I don't know anything about her as an author, but it feels like she took this very real fear that a lot of women have these days and she didn't like do anything uh, really transgressive with it, but like taking all of her fear and putting it into this dude who is like this evil person, but also is kind of charming, but also is awful was really interesting and I'm so mixed on it and I want to read the rest of the books. I don't know if I want to watch the show though, because I think it will lose that, that element for me. If mm-hmm. it's just like, I'm watching a, an actual dude actually stalk and kill people. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Cause he's not actually charming. He's actually kind of a loser. And if you don't have his like running inner monologue, I feel like that would be harder. I don't know if I would recommend it. It's really fucked up. It's like a very intense read, but it is really well written. And I understand why people like it. And I probably will continue to read this fucking series. <laughs> a lot of these books are really getting me. I picked up The Cat Diary, Yawn and Moo by Junji Itu because so many pe- people recommended it to me when I said like, oh, I just read Uzumaki. It makes me want to tear my skin off. It's so scary. <laughs> and everybody was like, you should read this book about his cats because it's written in his or it's drawn in his terrifying style, but it's just about him and his cats. And it's really short and super delightful <laughs> because <laughs> it is written or it, it is drawn horrifically because the cats look kind of terrifying and he draws his wife without pupils <laughs> and it's just him being kind of terrified of his cats. But my favorite, my absolute favorite scenes that he drew and he repetitively draws it is when his wife is playing with the cats or doing something with the cats and they're giving her attention or they're being really cute and he wants that attention. So he jumps in and like tries to play with the toy or tries to get them to sit in his bed and they reject him and his like rejection face. (laughs) It looks like he's being like disemboweled, but it's just him wanting attention from the cats so much and them rejecting him. (laughs) It was very charming. He is quickly becoming an author that I just absolutely adore. I'm waiting for many of his books from the library right now. He rules. I'm very happy everybody recommended that to me. Uh, For my romance-only book club with my husband, I he read it, but I listened to the audiobook because it's narrated by Lori Prince, who I think I've mentioned before, but has like a porn star voice. Like she... And she almost exclusively does lesbian like romance and erotica, and she's very good. And I was like, oh, she narrated this? I don't care that we own this book. I have to have the audio book. I will have no other experience. <laughs> but the the premise of the book is called Satisfaction Guaranteed by Creela States Waters. It's about a really uptight woman who is the accountant and uh, co-manager of this really high-scale art gallery that her parents run but her parents are like hippy dippy woo woo whatever and so she's basically given up her life to make sure that they don't destroy this business and her aunt dies so they have to go to this funeral and her aunt was also hippy dippy woo woo and she was just like quirky old lady who had a bunch of young like friends and she owned a sex toy store and was just like this wonderful old lady like the opening scene is everybody at the funeral is wearing yellow because the woman or everybody at the funeral is wearing like gold, like gold lame and stuff because that's what the aunt wanted. But Cade, the like uptight one is just wearing regular funeral attire. Like that sets the stage. And this woman, the other woman whose name I'm blanking on worked at the sex toy store and also like lived with the, um, the aunt in like the, back house because she was down on her luck and the aunt was like just work at the store and live with me whatever so they became really close and she became like a motherly figure the aunt leaves the sex toy store to these two women to like run together but it's underwater like the debt is insane and they have like a month to turn it around and one of them is like quirky and her and like an artist but has like a a dark past and one of them has is this uptight girl who's always the one that has to clean up everybody else's messes, but also has never had an orgasm. (laughs) Now she has to run a sex toy store. And it's so ridiculous. Like when I first gave this book to Nick, I was like, what if we read this one? He read the back and he was like, he even called it. He goes, I bet you they get left the store by like a quirky aunt. (laughs) Then he read the first (laughs) chapter and he was like, I fucking nailed it. (laughs) But it's, it's super charming. The, 
you know, I read a lot of romance. There are a lot of tropes that happen, but I kept being like, oh, so this, he read it before me, my husband. And I was like, so this happens, this happens, this happens. He goes, nope, that none of that happens. And I was like, really? That feels like the natu- logical next step. And then I'd be like, what about this, this? And he's like, nope, that's not what happens. I think it has like a lot of good conflict, but they also really, the characters are not super ridiculous. They, their motivations make sense. The way that the book ultimately shakes out, I think, is not super obvious. It's really funny. The sex scenes are good. And I highly recommend the audiobook because Lori Prince, <laughs> boy, do I have a crush on her voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I read The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker, which is the novella that inspired Hellraiser. I'm not really going to talk about it here because I'm going to talk about it a lot on the next episode of Spooky 30s, which will come out very soon. So needless to say, I'm now super obsessed with Clyde Barker after doing a lot of research about him. He reminds me in a very different way, but how when we were reading Point B, the character of Bammer, like he should be obnoxious, but was actually very charming. And I listened to like and read a lot of interviews with Clyde Barker and I was like, this man should be obnoxious, but he is super charming and I love him. And the book, (laughs) if you read Hellraiser, the book is very, very similar to the movie with some like notable changes, but but it's pretty similar. So if you like Hellraiser, you'll probably like Hellbound Heart. And it's interesting to see the parallels. And it's pretty short. It's like 163 pages with some pretty big font. And then this will go right into my my rave if we want to just do that. Oh, I've yeah. been reading just like truly a shit ton of comics. I when, when last we spoke, when I was talking about comics, I was at X of Swords. I went through and made a month by month Marvel publishing like calendar of all the X books that I had fallen behind on. And I'm systematically going back and month by month reading everything, even the like weird, like offshoots and stuff. I'm at the hellfire gala right now. I like a lot of it. I still love Hellions. I really like way of X. I love X factor. I wish it continued on. I think X factor is really, really cool. I, there's a thing that happens in X factor because the mutants can't, die anymore their bodies can die but they can get regenerated because of this whole complicated thing but one of the kids in x factor he's name's prodigy and he like he he just like learns really really quickly like if he, he can stand next to you and kind of like osmosis things or watch you do something and learn it and he was like we have opportunity here to learn how mutants decay differently than humans so like let's build a body farm in our backyard yes. <laughs> and like that's yes. part of x factor is they just watch the bodies of their dead friends who are still alive but their former husks are behind there just decay and as that was like happening i was like aaron would really like this part hell yeah aaron would really like prodigy (laughs) (laughs) so i really like that stuff um i'm right at hellfire gala and it's been really fun i've been using reading comics as like like i'll do work and then i'll get a task done and then i'll read a single issue of comic and then like go back and that's like my reward system now yeah And the reason I've been catching up uh, with my comics more intensely is because I am working at Challengers again. That is my rave. Yay. It sounds so ridiculous because I bitch about how I'm busy all the time. But working at Challengers, which is my local comic book store, I've been going there since 2010. I'm friends with the owners. Like I literally invited them to my wedding. I used to work there before. They had an opening and Patrick texted me. He was like, hey, I know you're busy and stuff, but would you be interested in working at Challengers on Thursdays again? And I was like, oh, fucking hell yeah. <laughs> like That sounds fun <laughs> because I like being there. I like having a reason to read and talk about comics. I am working with um, another woman, Molly Jane, who rules. So like Fridays or Thursdays is like ladies day. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> and And it's been... A friend was like, are you catching up? Because they're like making you catch up. And I was like, no, no one's making me do anything. But it's it's been a good motivation to catch up all my, mm-hmm. all, on all my stuff. And it's just been really fun. And even though it's technically quote unquote work, it just feels like a fun thing to do. It gets me out of my house. I like dressed in real clothes the other day. <laughs> it's been really delightful. So if you are in Chicago and you want to hang out and get some comic books, come visit me at Challengers because... I'll be there on Thursdays. Hell yeah. So that's my 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 rave and me talking about comic books. I will tell you how I feel about the Hellfire Gala once I get through it. And then after that, I'm going back and I, like I'm going to read the uh, recent Nightwing run. I just picked that up. I have like the Robin series I need to catch up on. And then I'm going to catch up on Daredevil and like Devil's Reign. So I'm like getting there. I'm working on my Marvel books mostly. 
and then I will jump back in. But hey, I'm back. I'm reading comics all the time. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. What's Fuck your yeah. rave? Uh, my rave is modern medicine because I go to the doctor <laughs> fucking every single week right now. Uh, I know I've like raved about modern medicine as a technology a couple of times on the podcast during this pregnancy. You've also but, ranted uh, about like medicine too. So it's it, yes. it works. Yes, that's true. I'm very balanced. I, I can see both sides of this issue of modern medicine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I went to the doctor this last weekend or this last week uh, for my 38 week checkup and so I am very pregnant and my fetus, my kid inside of me my fetus. was, uh, was in the right position for birth, head down the way that they're supposed to be. And then this last week we went and my doctor checked my cervix and was like, all right, everything seems normal. You don't seem like you're about to go into birth at any moment. She was like, all right, I'm going to check the baby's position. Then she made this face <laughs> that was like, hmm, something doesn't seem right here. <laughs> She's like, all right, you're going to feel a bunch of pressure because I'm going to I'm going to try and move this kid around a little bit. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so she was like pushing on my abdomen. She was like, um, I'm going to need to do an ultrasound real quick. We're going to take you into another room and we're going to do an ultrasound real quick. And I was like, okay, sure. What? I, I mean, all I do is go to the doctor. So whatever you want to yeah, do, Yeah, we're best doctor. friends now. Let's just hang yeah. out, man. Sure. Absolutely. Whatever you want to do, doctor. And so she takes me into the ultrasound room. Michael and I are in there and we're like, what the fuck? we've already gone through enough. <laughs> like what the fuck is happening now? And she takes the ultrasound one, she puts it on me. And then she goes, ah, as I suspected, <laughs> baby's breached. <laughs> we are like, as oh, I suspected. Geez. And she shows it to us. And he went from like head down, perfect delivery position to like a straight up fucking cannonball. So he's ass down, <laughs> feet up, head up. Like, there is no way I can push this kid out naturally. It's just not going to happen. And so she was like, all right, well, we could do an inversion procedure, which if you don't know what that is and you'd like to be horrified, please feel free to look it up. It's I'm not great it right now. It's not great. Uh, and I didn't know those only work 50% of the time. So they could do this like painful procedure to try and move the baby where you could possibly puncture the water bag. You can break the water on X. Yeah, exactly. Your face is... <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Yes. And it only works 50% of the time. Horrific. Horrific. And yeah, so but so many people are determined to have a baby vaginally and not have a C-section that I could see people being like, yeah, do it. It's like, yeah. no, the um, statistics here and the pain are not worth it. No, not at all. And so she was like, all right, well, we can do this. We can schedule it or we can just schedule a C-section. And I was like, schedule a C-section. <laughs> Bitch, you wanted like, to schedule a C-section from the moment you got pregnant. Hell yes, I did. Are you <laughs> fucking kidding me? <laughs> Absolutely. That's what Michael keeps joking about it. And he's like, I feel like you've wanted to do this the whole time. I was like, not the whole time, but like, yeah, pretty much the whole time. <laughs> yeah, it's the like, whole time. It's not giving birth vaginally is not important to me like that my my role as a mother my like significance inside of the greater good of reproduction i don't give a fuck i am not a victorian <laughs> it is not 1822 there is modern medicine like one out of three children are born by cesarean section now it is so fucking safe i'm going to the best birthing center in the fucking country like yeah cut this kid you mean i can schedule a date and time and i can just walk in and an hour later i can have a fucking baby <laughs> yeah that's definitely what no, do i want to do here's the other thing about inversion you don't just immediately go into labor like if they break your water you do you have to like immediately give birth but they send you home you like have to go home and then wait for regular labor to start and then go back to the hospital and then you have a 50 50 shot that you might give birth regularly or get a c-section i was like fuck no <laughs> no i don't want to do that <laughs> sounds horrible so we scheduled a c-section i'm very excited about i mean i could go into labor at any moment i'm still very pregnant like <laughs> it, it could happen i would still have to get a c-section because of the way that he's sitting yeah but like as of the 14th at 6 p.m i'll have a baby <laughs> it's gonna be outside of me i'm gonna so, be working watching monday night raw and the whole time being like Aaron's having a baby right now. I know. Aaron's having a baby. 
<laughs> so it's funny. Our doctor was like, yeah, well, I'm I'm on call. These days, we'll, I will, I'll figure out a time. And the other nice thing is I know it'll be my doctor because yeah. we scheduled to be with her. And so, like, I, I met all of the other doctors in the practice and I would be fine with any of them being there for delivery. But, like, she's my doctor. And so I would rather it be her. That I've, I've been with her for this whole fucking, like, 30 weeks of this process. I've had her. And so it was nice to be like, all right, I know for sure it's going to be her. So I'm very excited about it. I've got one more doctor's appointment where she'll like go through the whole business with us from A to Z. This is what it'll look like. And then I go in that Monday and give birth. It's nice too. Cause I got to like tell my job, like you don't have to just wait for me to like go into birth at any moment. Like I will be done on Friday at five o'clock and then I will not be back till June. See you later. <laughs> so I have one more week of work where I will do nothing <laughs> and just sit around basically. But it was like, it felt like a huge relief, honestly. Yeah. It was really nice to be like, sure, there obviously my body could be like, nope, it's now. And like at any moment that could happen. But like to be able to just say, I know after this date and this time, I'll be done. I won't have to be pregnant anymore. I'll have my kid. I'll recovery from a C-section is not easy. It's going to be hard, but I'm very lucky. I get a lot of maternity leave. I get more maternity leave because I'm having a C-section also. And so like, I I have the time to recover. I could tell my parents this is when the baby will be here. And so they're going to be here and like they're going to feed our cats while we're in the hospital for a couple of days. Like and then they're getting an Airbnb and we'll like come over and help with all with like cleaning and stuff. Like it was such a huge relief. It's it's really nice to be able to be like, yeah, again, I'm not a fucking Victorian. I can like schedule this. <laughs> and as someone who's like super logistical in many ways, it was really nice to be like, here is a date and time and then it's over. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, then it just begins. Yeah. And then like, I'm sure people who have been pregnant have experienced this too. The last couple of weeks of pregnancy are emotionally exhausting because you're Every time you go to the bathroom, it's like, did my water break? Is it now? <laughs> like, it's just fucking it's like getting up in the middle of the night and being like, I have to turn the light on and make sure my water didn't break is fucking exhausting. And so like that pressure has been relieved. Like, obviously, I still have to be aware of it and monitor for that in case it happens. But like, I'm not feeling that like i have to always be on guard about it now it's just it's such a huge relief so modern medicine a plus thumbs up for this week <laughs> i'm very happy it exists well our rants are basically the same yes. thumbs down for ronda rousey <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Big oh, thumbs buddy. Down. just thumbs down across the board <laughs> <laughs> zeros across the board <laughs> zeros yeah. Uh, I feel like yeah. we bitched about Rana on this podcast so much that it feels like exhausting to talk about her again. But like, I mean, the Royal Rumble itself, I know you didn't watch it. I obviously did. I had a good time because we had people over and we pulled the numbers and stuff. Yeah. Uh, Rosemary and Jenna came over. It's their first time coming to like a pay-per-view with us. And we pulled numbers and fucking Jenna won both. Jenna walked out with 80 bucks because she pulled the numbers what? and she pulled Brock and she pulled fucking Rhonda. And <laughs> But like she was so delighted. She was like, I'm getting a tattoo tomorrow. So this is great. <laughs> she was like, invite me over whenever you want. <laughs> like, yeah, I fucking bet you want that, you asshole. So it was it was a fun night. And there were some really fun pops in the women's like rumble. I obviously freaked out for the Bellas, we knew they were coming, but it was still fun. I literally like leaned over and I was like, Brie Bella better be next. And her music hit. And I was like, I am a prophet. <laughs> it was really fun to see Alicia Fox and Ivory had such a great spot. Like it was fun. The women's rumble was fun in that way. The men's rumble wasn't fun in that way because like there wasn't really any good surprises or spots. But the actual matches were not great and not inspiring. And the moment Brock lost, it was like is this guy going to show up in the Rumble? Because when Seth lost, it felt like, okay, Seth could show up in the Rumble, and that would make sense and be kind of exciting. The moment Brock lost, we were all like, hub, hub. there's a reason <laughs> this this Rumble was happening later and not the Women's Rumble, which is the Rumble that had the actual like story and stuff like right. going in. And I think building up to the Women's Rumble was really exciting, but then as soon as the rumors started swirling and the rumors really felt more inevitable that Ronda was coming, a lot of the 
wind of the rumble got taken out of the, yeah. our sails. Because again, the thing with the rumble is that it's exciting. We don't know who's who's going to win and like, ugh. but it felt both choices just felt inevitable. And the inevitability of Ronda Rousey is annoying. And the fact that they tried to make her a heel for like 24 hours, like at the rumble and on raw, she was a heel. The way she was acting, the way that she was cutting promos, the way she was answering questions, her weird little like pinch face shrew scowl, like that was all heel stuff. And then on Friday, she was a, a face again or a tweener or whatever. But like, yeah, she should have been a face the whole time. Do I think she's a face as a person? No. But like Becky is whatever Becky is. And Charlotte Flair is a heel. Like right. what it, it feels like right now, too. This is a WWE problem, but especially on the main roster, everybody feels like a fucking heel. The, there are a handful of baby faces, and it's just so uneven. And to bring in this person that left as a face that, you know, sort of. A lo- sort of. Well, and that, like, lots of people like layman's, I guess, <laughs> whatever. It just felt so stupid. So it's like, not only did you have her come back, but now you're doing stupid shit with her. It's all stupid and dumb. Anyways. Yeah. Run us back. Yeah, it was, let me tell you, a wild experience. To, I was following along on Twitter and really enjoying following along. And like, I haven't watched in several years now. It's been a while since I've watched WWE. And, but it's still like, I like keeping up with it. And like, I talk to you every two weeks on this podcast. And so I like know a decent amount about what's going on. And like, I follow Cage Side. And so I every week see the tweets from the shows, even though I'm not watching them. So it was like delightful to just be like scrolling and like refreshing. And being and, like, like, ooh, Ivory, ooh, Alicia, ooh, whatever. Right. <laughs> because like what happens on the Rumble on Twitter is that it's just people screaming people's names. And so it's like, oh, okay, this person came on. Oh, okay, this person came on. And so it was, it was delightful to watch people be so excited. And it was like, ah. It, it wasn't even like a balloon popped. It was like a hot air balloon exploded. On <laughs> and the a timeline. bunch of people plummeted to their death. <laughs> yeah, that's what it, it was just like. As soon as Rhonda came out, it was just people being like, boo. <laughs> like that Get scene from the Princess Bride where it was just like, boo, boo. <laughs> and as soon as it happened, I was like, oh, so she's winning, of course. Like, there's no mm-hmm. way they brought her back to lose. Like, that's not how it goes with Rhonda. It's never been that way. And like, it's unless she's leaving to have a baby right and it was like i've never felt so relieved to not be watching it, there was this moment of like thank fucking god thank god I, I wasn't watching this to feel this disappointment thank god i didn't have to like look at her dumb stupid face like i just i cannot stand her i am so annoyed by the fact that she's part of wrestling yep she's not good like watching I watched one of the um, the promos that she did. She's just awful at it. Like in, on a level that's like, you literally can't write people to be this bad at it. Like it, it's, and like the crowd noise that they pipe in during her promos is just ridiculous. Like she's terrible at talking. She's yeah. truly terrible at talking, which fine. Like it's not everybody's thing. And especially somebody who like, I mean, she didn't really have to talk as an MMA person. She just come in, scowl and do the like one thing she did. Right. Right. Um, And the fact that they know that about her, she's already had a run. We know she's bad at this part. Do something else with her. Get her. Why doesn't she have a manager? Exactly. It's so bizarre. And it's like, does no one want to work with her? Does she refuse to work with people? Like, what's the fucking deal? Like, it doesn't make sense. And it is. Again, I'm just so relieved I'm not watching it. It's it is ah. it's such a giant relief to just watch other people be pissed about it. it <laughs> it's fucking wild. And like, I I didn't know who won the men's rumble for like days. <laughs> I I like it just didn't come up. <laughs> I didn't see any. I went to bed and like then I didn't see anyone talking about it, which was like not a great sign. <laughs> that it's like everyone just kind of was like, yeah, well that was inevitable. We're just not going to talk about this, I guess. And it was like okay. the inevitability of Brock Lesnar, but then who is doing out- a good job, but it was just like not an exciting rumble thing, especially because right. it feels like he's going to win it back at elimination chamber. So it was yeah. like, well, why did you even lose? Because, Oh, cause you didn't put any effort into your men's rumble. So you were like, fuck. Oh, I don't know, Brock. <laughs> well, that's the thing too, is that there's all these reports that they changed it. Like, 
dozens of times before yeah. it, like literally up until the point that the rumble started that they were like rewriting things and then shane got fired afterwards like reports say morale at wwe at an all-time low how can My, it continue okay, to get lower like how do you get the lower bigger than the crust of the earth <laughs> they're bigger their end of year payout is as a company the lower the morale is for real it is wild and but then to find out that like the person who was originally supposed to win was, win was fucking Riddle. And it's like, so you really just wanted two MMA people to win both of these. That's that's all it is. And it's like, that's not exciting. What? Why? Why does MMA have to be so fucking involved in wrestling? Like, what's the fucking point? Yeah, they're different. And, and I feel that way, too, about AEW doing this shit with Dan Lambert, where, like... Oh, my God. Oh, my God, dude. I I feel two ways about it. I'm I'm impressed that for someone who's never been involved with wrestling, Dan Lambert is a great fucking heel. It's so easy to hate him. He's surprisingly good. I think he's good. a lazy fucking heel because like well, yeah, yes. it's easy to get over if you're saying actually shitty inflammatory inflammatory stuff. A, a great heel is Kevin Owens or Daniel Bryan. Yes. Those are great heels. This guy is a lazy fucking piece of shit and I hate everything he's doing sorry it's like, i no, have to, i hate no. this motherfucker so much he literally ruins like uh he ruins entire segments and like i get so mad that like the matches and shit that follow after him i'm still like steaming mad that he's like ruining the night for me and now he's showing up multiple times yeah it, it's like i can appreciate that as someone who has like no training that he, like if he came out and was as bad as ronda is it would it like it's unwatchable in some ways, but like the fact that he can at least talk. I mean, he is... has charisma. He's good yeah. at talking. I agree with that. I just like, I just push back on the idea that he's like good at being a heel. I think he's good at being an asshole and that's well, actually different. Yes. That's, that's fair. That's a fair point. But like, okay. So this last week on dynamite, there was the Brandy page Van Zant shit, right? Like this page Van Zant stuff has been building because like, she came out during the inner circle stuff with American top team, but it was like, what the fuck is the point of this? There are no women in the inner circle. She should have kicked are... Jericho's ass. Like what, what is the fucking point of bringing her out when you don't do intergender wrestling? Like this is really fucking stupid. And so when Brandy came out, I was like, well, I don't give a fuck about Brandy either. So I was like, what a perfect time to go feed my cats. And so I just like <laughs> left the room and I came back and Michael just had this like horrified look on his face. And he was like, I almost wish you had been here so you could have seen how fucking bad this was. And was I look bad. and, and Paige Van Zandt is in the ring and they're like scrapping or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, well, at least this makes sense that they've like finally given her a woman to push her towards. But like, who the fuck is the heel? Like, it, it seems like they don't know. And it doesn't seem like anyone cares to find out. The best tweet I saw about it was... Uh, from Artcore X, she quoted somebody and they were like, who's the heel in this segment? And her response was, TBS for making us watch this bullshit. <laughs> Which, like, absolutely true. And it's like, what, Brandy's not good. It's not like she's going to be able to help someone who is not a professional wrestler who is yeah. having her first bout. Like, this is going to be a nightmare. And to give half of the women's screen time to this is fucking annoying and like why must we suffer through all of this mma bullshit and why like, must we suffer and as someone who like watched a lot of mma and enjoyed a lot of it for a long time because michael hosted a podcast about mma and like worked for the ufc indirectly for some things like I don't need these things to be intertwined. It's not fucking necessary and it's annoying as shit. And like, I don't need this. And like, if there's, uh, I, I just don't need it. I don't need it to be on another program. I don't need it to be its own separate thing. I don't fucking need it. If I no, wanted to watch MMA, I would watch MMA. If people in MMA want to be professional wrestlers, get fucking trained. Like at least yeah. with Brock, he was a professional wrestler who well, became a MMA fighter who went back to being a yes. professional wrestler. Like he's trained to do this. And like, I would well, argue Matt Riddle's a piece of shit, but like he is too. Shayna is too. He, he put the Sonya work in. Shayna put the, they, that's the thing. Like they stopped being in MMA. They stopped and, being MMA fighters and they became professional wrestlers. Right. Exactly. This idea of like, Bobby Lashley. I'm gonna, 
yeah, I'm going to cling to the fact that I'm an MMA fighter and that's what makes me interesting. I'm not fucking interested in that. Right. And like, I'm shit. not watching professional wrestling for shoot wrestling. Like, no, I'm not, not watching. At all. I don't I don't believe that you're a badass because in this world, it in this world, you have to actually be good at a different type of fighting to look good. You can be the best MMA rest, uh, best MMA fighter in the world, but that doesn't necessarily translate to wrestling. And like this, just this idea that because you are an MMA fighter, you're like a you can be a good wrestler, or you're like an ultimate badass or whatever. Like that's boring. Like we don't live in a world with kayfabe. Like I know that this is fake. I'm here for people who are good at this job. Right. And like another great example of someone who stopped being an MMA fighter and became a professional wrestler is Kane Velasquez. Like he's put in the time and work to like really become a good professional wrestler and like is still very green in that but doesn't rest on the laurels of i was an mma champion he's like i'm a fucking professional wrestler now and this is what i do that i can get down with but this like i'm here i'm a professional or i i was a professional fighter and so that means that i deserve to be here like no the fuck you don't and i don't need to see your dumb face i want to see the other people who were here who were hired to be here because they're fucking professional wrestlers like it is just so irritating. and like i'm cool with green i really like jade cargill there's a yeah. lot of green people that there's I like fun a lot. It's, the, it's fun to watch people get better like that right, exactly. that's an element of professional wrestling too Right. But to like show up and be like, I get this big spot because I'm this personality from this other type of fighting. Like I'm just fucking over it. Agreed. So over it. Specifically with the Dan Lambert thing. And I have bitched about this here. I have bitched about this on the cage side podcast. I bitched about it on my Twitter. I bitched about it on cage sites, Twitter. I bitch about it to anybody who will listen. And I will, I will continue to bitch about it because it doesn't make any sense. The thing that pisses me off about Dan Lambert the most is he is continuously talking for people who don't need a manager and who don't need him. And he's bringing them down. Ethan page and Scorpio sky are both very good on the mic and do not need this old blowhard dude to talk for them. They don't. And Lance Archer, I think he's pretty decent on the mic, but even if he wasn't, he fucking already has a manager. It yeah. makes Jake feel really weird and redundant and like why? It's unnecessary. Sure, if you want him to come out and talk for his like actual UFC bullshit guys, whatever, sure. Well, but also then he should just be doing that. Like why is he talking for wrestlers who can talk and who yeah. don't need him? Yep. <sighs> it's very very frustrating. <laughs> it's exhausting. Palette cleansers, let's pick a question from the big stack of hey. questions digital version. Baby. Baby. So, please pick a number between 1 and 29. Um 4. Would you rather do the whole naked and afraid thing or spend a night in a real haunted house? Oh, real haunted house. Absolutely. 100%. I've never like, seen the show Naked and Afraid, so I actually don't really know what goes on other than that you're naked. They drop you in the woods naked with no supplies and you just have to survive. I'm like, no, thank you. For how long? <laughs> I don't know. Too long. Longer than a day. <laughs> like, yeah. I think it's like a week. What? Yeah, it's it's a fucking long time. I'm like, no, thank you. I'm not a survivalist. I don't know how to start a fire without matches. I don't know how to fucking hunt for rabbits. You I can't glasses. I'm, pull the whole Lord of the Flies thing. <laughs> spend a whole day naked trying to do that shit. No fucking thank you. <laughs> like yeah. See, oh god, that's a really hard one because they're both hard. But like the first thing that I think of when I think being in the wilderness naked is there are so many things that could crawl so many places that they shouldn't crawl. Yes. Absolutely. Number like, one, I would like my holes to be <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no and fucking thank you. Well, like- I don't want to be in a real haunted house. The the idea that I get clothes is pretty good. And it doesn't say that I will die in this haunted house. I don't know. It also man. doesn't specify what kind of haunted house it is. That's true. It could be a really chill haunted house. <laughs> if it's like like is it like a poltergeist house like that would be hard and it would be really shitty to do that for a night but at the same time like if i'm prepared for a haunted house i feel like i can like muster the courage to get through that it's not like i move into a house and i'm building a life with my family and then all of a sudden my house is haunted like that's a whole different thing (laughs) like that if i like 
okay, I'm going to walk into this house. And then I go into the kitchen and all the chairs are stacked or whatever. Like, okay, well, <laughs> whew, here we go. <laughs> Starting this like, journey. Oh, baby. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and there's an end date. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I get to leave this house tomorrow morning. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Maybe a night like, isn't even 24 hours. Day. We'll go back very quickly. Yeah, a night isn't even 24 hours. That's like, I got to be here for 12 hours. Okay, that sounds awful, but I but get like, my clothes. Right, exactly. And like, I could put my back against a wall for 12 hours and like figure it out. I, I think I could just do stand that. stand in the corner and find anything in the house with iron on it and just be like, okay, I'm here. Do this. Yeah, I could do that. You can't do that in the woods. <laughs> That's yeah. not how the fucking woods work. I need my holes to be covered. <laughs> right? I, like, don't drop me a place where I can get malaria. I'm not interested in that. Pass. Hard pass. <laughs> All right. And instead of doing a second question, I have a targeted Peg Mary kill for you from Jolene. <sighs> Heavy sigh. Heavy sigh. All right. I don't know like any of these <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense all right i do know this one alexia terabody okay kitty pride donna haskum wow that's a really intense one okay i would kill alexia because we're actually too similar in personality <laughs> That's what Jolene said that you would say. <laughs> yeah. Alexia, I identify with Alexia and I would like her life. I would like to just jump into her life, but we're too similar. Okay. I would have sex with Kitty Pride. obviously. I've had like Fair. a crush on her for forever. And when she came out officially in the comics, I cried for a pretty long time. I <laughs> tear up like thinking about it, frankly. <laughs> And I would marry Donna Haskum, obviously. Yeah, that makes sense. I would marry her in an instant. She's, that makes sense. She's hot and she's charming and she's like really sweet <laughs> and she could protect me from vampires. Yeah, That's that my girl. Like an easy choice. That makes that makes a lot of sense. All I right. bet you she's a good cook. She's from Minnesota. <laughs> oh yeah, that means she's a good cook. <laughs> means your arteries will be full in like two yeah. years, but that's fine. I get to be besties with with uh, Jody because they're besties. Like this seems like a win for me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, that's it. That's the podcast. I actually don't know what will be happening in the next couple of weeks because you know a four months and child. Yes, uh, we might be taking a break. I might have some guest hosts on. Aaron might be like, I need a break from this child for an hour. Who knows what will happen? Yeah. <laughs> so we'll TBD for the next couple w- weeks. But bear with us. Yeah, Aaron's we'll supposed to become a mom. Yeah. And we didn't actually take a hiatus like we normally do this year. So we've, uh, we've got some goodwill built. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> In the meantime, right. you can follow us on the internet. I'm at Stella underscore Cheeks on Twitter. I'm at Urgen C on Instagram. You can follow us as a podcast production company on Instagram at and Twitter at NYD Productions. And you can use the hashtag for this podcast, hashtag not your demo pod. You can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash NYD Productions, where you get access to all kinds of shit. Extra podcasts. We will also be figuring that out while I'm on maternity leave. We had plans to do an Every Mania ever, and then I was like, oh shit, I'm too pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be watching wrestling this pregnant. That's, that's insane. Uh, so we will be figuring that out, but their unofficial channels is up there. All of our outtakes and extras from extracts are up there and extra stuff from spooky thirties. The new episode of spooky thirties comes out on February 13th. As we mentioned earlier, it will be the Hellraiser movie slash book and accoutrement to that. <laughs> yeah. With one of our besties, L Collins. It's going to be a fun one. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to listening to that uh you also get access to our discord where we do our not your demo book club we have our next book picked out it's the gutter mage yes by j.s kelly and i think we set the yeah we'll be meeting on march 13th at 5 p.m eastern so you have plenty of time to read it because it's around like 300 pages i think So you could get access to our Discord and our book club via our Patreon for as little as a dollar. And then we also have a bunch of other channels where we talk about comics and wrestling. There's all kinds of shit up on the Discord. Bunch of bullshit. (laughs) It's just a fun time. It's just like a group chat. It's just a segmented group chat. (laughs) It's a whole hodgepodge of group chats. Uh, And I think that's it, right? Yeah, you can email us if you want. If you have questions uh, you want to add to the digital 
stack of questions or if you yeah. have peg mary kills mm -hmm. or if you have book recommendations or if you have manga recommendations for me comics whatever we're there not your demo at gmail.com and also if you could rate review us and subscribe to on whatever platform you listen to i know spotify does reviews i'm sure other podcasters do reviews and ratings so yeah. that's nice if not whatever it's not your demo pod we don't care <laughs> so relaxed we're the chillest podcast super chill super chill all right. Well, that's it. Congratulations. Next time you listen, Aaron will have a kid. I'll have survived birth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Congratulations to people who've been listening to this for like seven fucking years. <laughs> it's <laughs> now a journey I'll be a of our life. Right? <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>